Let's talk about the vascularization of the brain. A fifth of your total blood volume goes to the brain. And you can have irreversible brain damage within six minutes if you shut off the uh, blood supply to an area of the brain. And again, the vessel diameter is not governed by the sympathetic nervous system. It's governed more by the concentration of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen ion, whether they're, they're going to dilate or constrict. The blood supply of the brain is derived from two major uh, arterial systems. One located is more and uh, more anterior side, uh, which uh, came from the two internal carotid arteries, which you can see in the picture. And uh, uh, this artery supplies 80% uh, of the, the central nervous system. And uh, the uh, other uh, the other supply are the posterior circulations, uh, which came from the vertebral artery. Uh, these two vertebral artery will combine to form a basilar artery. This artery supplies 20% of the central nervous system. One of the main blood suppliers to the brain, of course, is the carotid, internal carotid artery, okay? And it, because it branches off to form the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, and also a posterior communicating artery. Another big branch off the internal carotid is the anterior cerebral artery. And you can see in the top right picture, the area is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. So you can see that it's supplying the paracentral lobule. And if you'll recall, the paracentral lobule, in this case, it's a right, that right paracentral lobule, if you knock that out, you would lose motor and sensory to the contralateral lower extremity. And you can go back to that homunculus diagrams in previous lectures to see why that's the case. The uh, artery which uh, connect the uh, two anterior uh, cerebral artery, it's the anterior communicating artery. Uh, so they are on only one of this artery. And uh, uh, this area is a common site for the aneurysm. And uh, because of uh, the force of the air, uh, the uh, blood flow, and uh, the um, aneurysm may press the the optic chiasm because it's very close to the optic chiasm, and it can cause visual deficit. The middle cerebral artery is a biggie because it's the main one that typically ca causes the strokes in the patients that you see. And you can see in the bottom right picture is showing mostly the distribution of the middle cerebral artery. So you can see it's it's supplying blood to the precentral gyrus, the postcentral gyrus, Broca's motor speech area, Wernicke's area. So all these really key areas, the optic tract uh, supplies little branches of the optic tract. So you knock out that optic tract, you have uh, visual field deficits on the other side. There are some uh, little uh, branches came from the uh, middle cerebral artery. If you look at the picture, you can see the uh, uh, arteries labeled with bright yellow color. That is a lenticular uh, striate artery and it's a uh, perforating artery which supplies the uh, deep cerebral uh, structures. Here's another picture shows you the um, uh, striate and the perforating uh, artery, uh, which came from the uh, middle cerebral artery. You can see the artery goes to this um, 
uh, basal uh, ganglia, the internal capsule, and then uh, go to the insula. If you look at this picture, you can see the internal carotid artery and the proximal part of the medial cerebral artery are very close to the optic chiasm. So if you have any like, hemorrhage uh, from these arteries, it can um, affect the vision, uh, vision pathway. So the patient may have this ipsilateral nasal hemianopsia. So uh, connect to our previously lecture and think about why the patient have this um, vision field deficit. Another branch from the internal carotid artery system is a posterior communicating artery, which uh, I labeled it with blue color. And this uh, artery connects this um, internal carotid artery to the posterior cerebral artery. These uh, posterior cerebral artery are not come from the internal capital carotid artery. Um, so this side is also a common side for the aneurysm. So the internal carotid, carotid artery and its branches supply a good bit of the cerebral cortex. The other main supplier of blood to the cortex and the brainstem are the vertebral arteries. They come off the subclavian arteries, run through this transverse foramen of the first six cervical vertebrae, and then they, they're going to form branches. They also they form branches that supply the spinal cord, and then branches that supply the cerebellum with the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Uh, superior cerebellar artery is going to come off the basilar artery. So the, the two vertebral arteries form the basilar artery and then you get other branches off of that. The anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, labyrinthian, pontine arteries, and the two superior cerebellar arteries. And then the two posterior cerebral arteries. If you look at the picture, you can see the two vertebral artery from the uh, the anterior side of the uh, spinal cord and goes up and runs in the middle of the anterior pants. So uh, it combined together to form this basilar artery. This uh, basilar artery and then give out a lot of branches and then uh, from the inferior to the uh, to the superior, you can see the first one is the ICA. The ICA means the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So these are the branches uh, like just uh, superior to to uh, the two uh, the beginning of the basal artery. And then this one supplies the anterior and inferior cerebellum and um, uh, part of this, um, uh, the caudal pumps. And then uh, if you go up with this basilar artery, you can see the other branch, that is the superior cerebellar artery. These branches supplies to the superior cerebellum, the um, uh, caudal midbrain, and the uh, rustal pumps. And if you look at between this uh, um, 
superior and inferior cerebellar uh, arteries. You can see there are some small branches come out from the come out from the basal artery. That is a pontine artery. These small branches supplies uh, the pants. So um, blockage of this uh, basal artery can lead to this unlocking uh, syndrome. And uh, there are other, there, you have other uh, small branch that came from the ICA that is a uh, labyrinth uh, artery, we also call it internal auditory artery, which supplies the inner ear. So any like occlusion of this area could lead to mm, the uh, problem of inner ear. Uh, the patient will have the vertigo or the ipsilateral deafness. Here you can see the blood supply of the cerebellum, and you can see the superior cerebellar artery, uh, which came from the basal artery and to the superior um, part of the cerebellum, and uh, the ICA, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, came from the beginning of the um, basal artery, and then go to the anterior and inferior part of the cerebellum. And uh, there's another artery we call it uh, pica, that is a posterior inferior cerebellar artery, but they are not came from basal artery, they came from the vertebral artery. So if um, this artery came from the vertebral artery, the pica, have any uh, like congestion or occlusion, uh, the patient may have this uh, Wallenberg syndrome. Uh, the patient could have uh, this uh, difficulty for swallowing, have difficulty for the uh, sounds, uh, and uh, we have vertigo and uh, uh, nystagmus uh, and uh, like ataxia. That's a lot of uh, problem just because of um, this supply from this artery. This is an interesting uh, disorder called locked-in syndrome, a complete basilar artery thrombosis with bilateral infarction of the pons. So you would have quadriplegia. Why do you think that would be? Because you you decrease the blood supply to those all those motor fibers going through the basilar pons. You'd have impairment of function of cranial nerves uh, 5 through 12 because they're all in that vicinity. And mutism because you can't talk. But what's preserved is consciousness. The only thing they can communicate with is blinking and vertical eye movements. Why would they be able to blink and have vertical eye movements? I want you to think about that. Why? The last branch came from the basal artery is the posterior cerebral artery, the PCA, uh, which uh, goes back uh, and then uh, supply the, the medial and inferior surface of the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe and also part of this uh, midbrain and the, uh, the uh, diencephalon. And then kind of this little circle of Willis, which I'm sure you got in your anatomy in the summer, which is composed of the anterior communicating artery, the anterior cerebral arteries, the inferior cerebral artery, the posterior communicating, and the posterior cerebral arteries. And it forms kind of a little alternative route. If one of the main arteries is blocked, it's, it's possible for the blood to get to the other side or blood coming from the other side to supply that area. The problem with that is those vessels are very small and they're not normally open. So it would have to be a slow blockage of one of those major arteries for blood to be able to, for those vessels to expand out, to accommodate it. If it was a sudden blockage, those vessels in the circle of Willis wouldn't be able to open up quickly enough to, to uh, transport the blood in a different direction. 
So it would have to be a slow blockage for that circle Willis to work. Now we finish uh, our artery supply of the brain. And now we talk about the uh, uh, vein of the brain. So the uh, blood comes back from the brain will uh, go back to the internal uh, jugular, uh, jugular vein from the external cerebral vein, from the internal cerebral vein, and also like uh, they all will join to the sinus. And um, if you look at the picture on the right side, you can see on the top, so superior to the fox, and you can see that is a superior sagittal sinus. Inferior to it, you have the inferior sagittal sinus. And then between this um, uh, inferior sagittal sinus to the confluence of sinus, you have this straight uh, sinus. And then it goes to the lateral side to form this transverse sinus. And then uh, come to this um, sigmoid sinus and finally, will uh, join to this internal jugular vein. Remember we are we when we talk about the uh, meninges of the brain, we talk about the dura mater. The two layers of the dura mater separate and then form this um, dural sinus. And that is the um, that the sinus we talk about you, you have this superior sagittal, inferior sagittal, you have straight sagittal, and then the transverse sigmoid, and then the internal jugular vein. Here's another picture which helps you to understand the location of this, um, uh, this sinus. Bridging veins are important because they're little veins that connect your cerebral veins to the, sad, to the sinuses. So in other words, branches off the superior cerebral vein go through the subarachnoid space and they have to pierce through the arachnoid membrane to get into the sub, go across the little potential subdural space to get in through the dura matter to actually enter, cause that blood to go into the superior sagittal sinus. So it's a bridge between the superior cerebral vein. It has to bridge through the arachnoid and the dura mater to dump that blood into the superior sagittal sinus. So if you have a rupture of that bridging vein somewhere in there, you could have either a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a subdural hemorrhage. So despite all this blood supply we've talked about, there's, most of the nervous system does not come into direct contact with the blood. It's separated from the blood by the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier is composed of the endothelial cells that make the walls of the capillaries are pretty tight together. And on top of that, you have those astrocytes kind of separating the neurons from the blood vessels. Our brain is a highly metabolic uh, organ, and it because it always have this electrical activity, and it requires uh, like very uh, uh, good enough blood supply for the oxygen, oxygen and the nutrients. So, um, like maybe only uh, twenty seconds of this. Uh, Short, shortage of this blood supply will cause uh, the change of this electrical activity and uh, maybe uh, they uh, like they uh, there will be uh, irreversible brain damage only after a few minutes <laughs>
So uh, let's talk about the deficit after an atrial occlusion. Here's a picture which shows you the um, cerebral artery branches supply the uh, specific area. And uh, we already talked about the like anterior cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral artery, um, the medial cerebral artery. So if you can see, this is a coronal uh, section of the brain. And you can see the anterior cerebral artery goes to the uh, longitudinal fissure. So it, it, it supplies the medial, medial side of the, uh, the uh, brain and uh, the medial the uh, middle cerebral artery is the uh, uh, largest branch and uh, it supplies most uh, of this uh, cerebral cortex. And then the posterior cerebral artery supplies this um, inferior and middle side of the uh, temporal lobe and also supplies the occipital lobe. So different um, Conjunct, uh, conjunct occlusion of this uh, plus uh, of uh, a specific cerebral artery will cause a different uh, deficit. If you look at this picture, uh, the blue area is the uh, supplied by the anterior cerebral artery, so that is the superior and medial aspect of the frontal lobe and also the superior and medial side of the parietal lobe. So, and also uh, because if you look at from the inferior view, it also goes to the medial, me, medial uh, part of the brain that would be the basal, new, uh, basal ganglia and also the corpus callosum. Here's the result of this uh, occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery. So the symptom will depend on which, uh, air, which cerebral cortex area are uh, affected by this occlusion, artery occlusion. So for example, the, if the primary motor cortex um, got affected, the, it will cause this um, uh, contralaterals, contralateral hemiplegia. So because you remember, if you remember the, uh, the uh, yeah. homunculus and the, uh, in the primary motor cortex, the leg, the lower limb is located in the medial, medial side of the brain. So it, um, the symptom will be worse in the leg. So for the medial cerebral artery, and uh, this uh, is the largest one, so this is the most common side uh, of uh, occlusion or end stroke. So if you look at this picture, the yellow part will be supplied by the uh, middle cerebral artery. So that is the uh, most of the lateral surface of the brain. Uh, the inferior surface of the frontal lobe, the uh, internal capsule, and the basal ganglia. Here's an, another form uh, shows you this um, um, different affected area. Uh, result from the occlusion of the uh, left medial, middle cerebral artery. And uh, if this um, primary motor cortex uh, affect because of this left middle cerebral artery, because it mm, will affect the lateral, lateral part of this uh, mm, uh, cerebral cortex. So if you remember that we have upper, upper limb and face on the lateral side. So the patient may have this contralateral hemiplegia, but it will 
like the symptom will be worse in the arm and uh, can patient will have this aphasia have this um, uh, sensory loss have the visual visual field caught because of the um, visual pathway located in the temporal lobe and uh, the the, uh, the uh, pride lobe and uh, the patient patient can have this uh, um, this uh, cognitive impairment This is another uh, form which shows you if the patient have the right middle cerebral artery occlusion, uh, the patient may have this uh, vision food cock, a cut, uh, may have this uh, contralateral hemiplegia, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, patient may have this um, perceptual uh, deficit. They, they may have this left neglect we already talked about for the in the previous lectures. Um, this picture just shows you the uh, supplies for the posterior cerebral artery, uh, which was um, the red, the pink uh, area in the picture. So uh, the posterior cerebral artery, which supplies the medial and the inferior surface uh, if you look at the uh, brain from the inferior view and the medial side and uh, also this uh, posterior cerebral artery will supply the occipital lobe and uh, part of this midbrain and the diencephalon so the occlusion of this uh, posterior cerebral artery can cause the memory loss, you remember that memory is about this, uh, mm, and this uh, hippocampus and which located in the middle side of the temporal lobe and uh, it have this uh, visual perceptual deficit and uh, visual uh, field cut because it affected the occipital lobe. So in the clinic, you may need to treat a lot of patients after stroke. So uh, that actually because of these um, com uh, compress or the interrupt of the blood supply to the brain, and uh, then this will lead to this uh, um, shortage of the oxygen and nutrition, and then it they will cause the cell death. And then there are two high, two primary types of this of the stroke. So one is the ischemic, uh, that's almost 80% of patient uh, uh, because of the shortage of the blood supply. And uh, the other 20% of the patient uh, because of the hemorrhage of the uh, brain blood supply. Uh, there's a, a surgical procedure we call it carotid inductor ectomy. Um, this uh, surgery, this sur uh, surgery, the goal of it is to remove this uh, blockage uh, inside the internal carotid artery because this blockage can maybe small piece size of it uh, dropped from the the um, and the internal wall of the uh, blood vessel and then it will flow to the brain and then block the the uh, small branches of the uh, the brain and then it can cause the uh, the stroke and then uh, there are some other uh, terminology you need to know is uh, what is infarct. The infarct is the area for lack of uh, uh, blood supply. And this area will have this uh, cell death. And uh, the ischemia means 
the shortage or the restriction of the blood supply. Anoxia means uh, shortage of the oxygen, without oxygen. And hypoxia means the decrease of oxygen. A legend means uh, the injury uh, of the brain.